Well, we are here once again. Uh, welcome to the spring series of the Integrated Design Lab uh, lecture series uh, brought to you by University of Idaho and uh, the, our sister labs around the region. The funding, of course, is, brought to, uh, is provided by Better Bricks and uh, the commercial program for the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, Idaho Power, Avista, and uh, Rock, um, Northwestern Energy in Montana. Um, I'll just really re quickly restate, we are doing evaluations, so uh, we'll pass around some forms at the end. Um, evening, uh, this evening, the folks who are uh, watching online can send in their questions, I believe, to Gunnar G. Uh, that's G-U-N-N-A-R-G at uidaho.edu. Uh, a couple of upcoming items that I just wanted to throw out again in front of everybody. We have got Thomas Auer coming from TransSolar in Germany uh, on April 27th. And I think we're getting close to our registration deadline. So uh, April 20th, uh, $15 ahead of time or $20 at the door and lunch is included. Uh, Ari, when is this month's BSUG meeting? It had to be rescheduled. Next week. Next Friday. week, Friday, Friday at noon. Okay, so we have an outside guest coming this time, and we need to accommodate uh, their their new, their different schedule. Um, so, Ari, that is uh, Joe, Joe Huang, Huang from he's from. a retired at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, right? Yeah. Okay, and one of the early developers of DOE. Uh, so he'll have a lot of great experience to show. Um, we are hosting uh, just a, a it's a free ASHRAE webcast, right, Brad? Uh, which we are hosting here at the lab, and we'll also have a chance to discuss some of the results from Idaho Power Research from last year related to commissioning. The title is, uh, well, I don't have the title. It's a commissioning webcast uh, of some type that ASHRAE is providing on the 21st. And that runs from 10.30 till 3. Is that right? OK. Uh, tonight, we've got Ari Junaidi, which is our very own research scientist talking about some of the research he did last year funded by Idaho Power. Uh, and then there are two more uh, talks in our, in our spring lecture series. On April 22nd, which is next week, Thursday, uh, Lou Capozzi from the Genzyme Building in Boston. And on April 29th, Heather Burpee from the University of Washington on high performance hospitals. Uh, so with that, I will remind folks to sign in either now or after. I already, I already, I already hit that one. There are flyers for the Thomas Hour. Uh, lecture at the back if you'd like. Um, and Ari, I'll turn the floor over to you and uh, take it away. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, thank you, folks, for coming. I'm going to present uh, the results of uh, last year's project that we've been uh, working with uh, some of you guys, uh, consulting firms uh, in, in, in town about right sizing of uh, rooftop units and Idaho Power sponsored this uh, project. The <coughs> rooftop units are one of the most commonly used uh, HVAC systems. You look around, it's, it's, it's everywhere. In Northern California, in one study, it represents uh, 2.3 million tons of air, con air conditioning capacity. It's about 60, 70%. In uh, Pacific Northwest, is uh, the data. It's uh, a little bit uh, not that good compared to the California, but we 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 are confident it's not less than 34 percent of the commercial buildings are cooled with RTU. Uh, so uh, before we get to the uh, the, the project itself, this is how typically the uh, sizing is conducted and this will show you how uh, difficult it is to do a proper sizing. If you look at the temperature, outside air temperature throughout the year, and this is the hours of the year, we can see that the predominant temperature in Boise is between 50 to 70 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. But our design day temperature will be somewhere here, which represents probably 200 hours 
out of 8,760 hours. So it's right here. Now, to make it uh, even more complicated, this is one of the building that I simulated for this uh, project. This is the, uh, the cooling load, and I plotted against the outside air temperature. And you can see here that the peak actually happened not at the maximum temperature, but it happens some, some time, somewhere when the outside temperature is at 85. So it's about 10 degrees less than the uh, design day. So to make it even more complicated, this line here is the uh, air, co air conditioning capacity. Air conditioning capacity depends very much on the outside air temperature at the condenser, condensing unit. So as the air temperature goes down, the, the air conditioning capacity actually goes up. So you can see that most of the time, we will have this condition, right? Which is uh, representing many, many hours throughout the year. But we know during this hour, during this outside air temperature, we have a capacity that is way too high compared to the building load. So the air conditioning will operate on probably 30% or 25% of its capacity. This is what it's called, they are running on a part load condition. So when they run, at the part load condition, they become less efficient. So what, what we want to study is, we want to look how many out there, the units that are right sized. And we want to measure. And what we expect is to have this is the out, outside air temperature right here, and this is the compressor operation. For the right size unit, during the peak condition, it will operate continuously, never off. This is what we expect, and this is what we call it is right sized. But for oversized uh, air conditioning, we will expect a cycling on and off, on and off, all the time, even during the peak hours. So this is, uh, this is uh, the uh, background of uh, the project. And the scope of our project is uh, we focus on the RTU, which is uh, package, uh, package single zone without the VAV, so all constant volume. And, uh, the building size, we pick up small commercial buildings. And uh, building type, we focus on office buildings, if, uh, even if there is another building, uh, a, a building with uh, other, other end use or, or type, and we pick up the, the part of the building that is uh, functioning as an office. And then the age of the buildings, we pick up two category of the buildings. so. Uh, uh, the buildings that are designed uh, before 2001, we consider it as old. 2001 is the, the year where the energy code is first in, uh, adopted here in, in Idaho. So after that, we consider, cat, uh, categorize the buildings as new, and we uh, consider only uh, the cooling. So for this project, we sent out a survey to uh, firms in town to get the preliminary, preliminary data on office buildings RTU. So we sent out a survey. And based on the survey, we pick up several buildings from there to do a measurement. And then we did data analysis. And based on this, we go back to the initial survey and we did interviews 
with uh, some of you folks. And then we also do a simulation, and this will be described in, this, uh, in the lecture today. So the survey, uh, we sent it out to mechanical engineering firms uh, throughout the Treasure Valley, and we requested from each firm 10 buildings. If possible, five each, five old and five new. So uh, it's very general, uh, building name, uh, year of design, floor area of the office space, and then the capacity of the RTU serving that uh, office space. And then two out of the 10 buildings were selected, and then we did on-site monitoring and then follow-up interview and then simulation. So seven firms are contacted. Everybody is excited and they were willing to participate in, gen in general. Uh, six mechanical consulting firm and one HVAC contract contractor all supported the study, but then only four returned the data. So surprising as it is, it, it was really, some of the firms are difficult to, f to really find the types of building that we requested. Apparently, office and RTU don't work together. Maybe RTU are out there for the retail, which we don't do. So most of the uh, projects, uh, mo most of the firms that when, when we open up all the, the projects, apparently they have office buildings, but then not RTU using uh, some, some, some other type of the system. So, and there are other difficulties and these are all uh, listed here. Uh, and the conclusion is for return the data. So we have around 40 buildings to, uh, to uh, assess. So here is the uh, summary of the results. Uh, as you can see, we list the firm, we list the building, summary description, and then the year, and then total square foot, and we calculate, we summarize the square foot per ton. So, on average, it's anywhere between 275 to 488 square foot per ton of capacity. And for those of you who are not engineers, the rule of thumb for uh, the right sizing is the anywhere between 400 to 600 square foot per ton. So this is, uh, the, the, the result of the survey is anywhere between right sized to slightly oversized, okay? So the, the smaller the number, the more oversized it is because it covers, per ton of cooling capacity, it covers less space. So, uh, and Based on the data, we, we cannot see any significant, significant difference between firms and between the old and new. It means that all firms, some of the times, they got it right sized. Some of the times, they get it oversized. So there's no, uh, no consistent pattern. It's all random. And uh, based on, the, on that result, we came up with uh, five buildings. Uh, the firms that returned the, the uh, survey has difficulty in coming up with uh, the actual calculation for the buildings, especially the old buildings. Uh, the, the person who did the design have moved on, and uh, this is one, one of the, uh, one of the uh, reasons why. So we end up with uh, five buildings that are studied, 
uh, in the uh, uh, interview. And uh, I'm not going to uh, go through all the uh, interview questions. Uh, you can download the report. I'm sure uh, uh, Idaho Power will uh, release, uh, make, make the uh, report available for public uh, in, 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 in the near future. But these are the lessons learned. So the, the typical things that we found that can lead to uh, oversizing. Number one is the high internal load assumption, uh, especially for the old buildings. When we look at the uh, lighting load, for example, some of the buildings were designed for two watt per square foot of uh, lighting load which is unheard of if you look at the code. If the code level now is one watt per square foot. But for pre-code, this is pretty common. So uh, very high internal load assumption. And then the, the one thing that is so obvious is that external shading is never included in the calculation. Just it was taken out of the, of the building, even if the shading is fixed. So external shading, fixed shading, is never included in the calculation. And for northwest uh, orientation, probably it doesn't matter for north side. For, but for the south orientation, it, it will be significant. And then the safety factor, we'll talk about this uh, more in a minute. And then the communication with other members of the team can lead to oversize. For example, uh, the initial design, the drawing came with uh, a window type that is not so good. So the mechanical engineering team calculated the, uh, the sizing with not so good window. And then the architects and the owner work out the uh, cost plan. And on the last minute, they came out with a better window. But then the feedback to the mechanical engineering team is too late. And sometimes they don't have time to redo the calculation. So the building end up built with better glass with air conditioning that is calculated with the worst glass. So oversized, for sure. And uh, this is our measurement protocol. Uh, we measured one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight buildings. And uh, this is uh, uh, what we interviewed, five buildings. And we did one simulation for, uh, we did simulation only for one building. And two of the buildings actually have uh, simulation from the mechanical engineer. So we measured uh, outside air temperature, all the temperatures inside and outside. Uh, we also uh, measured the temperature uh, of the supply, the return, the mixed air. And the most important thing is that we measure the supply fan and the compressor current to see how it operates on and off. Uh, we measured nine RTUs, nine units uh, from eight buildings. The RTUs capacities are typically less than 10 ton, except for two buildings, uh, exactly at 10 and 17, but the 17 ton unit has actually two compressors. So each of them are less than 10 tons. Uh, and then measurements were carry out, carried out, uh, so we, we went to the building and we install. And then the, we, we keep on measure until at least we have one day where the temperature is above 95, which is the design day of uh, Boise. So uh, we get the data. And uh, mind you, we, we don't have that, m that many of 95. Eight buildings, we have practically eight weeks, and then it's gone. 
So uh, it's, it's very tight measurement schedule. So this is the typical measurement results. And this is uh, uh, building A is the one that I'm going to use as a case uh, study here. Uh, and uh, we will go through the, uh, the uh, calculation steps uh, step by step. This is the uh, outside air temperature. As you can see, it reached 100 degree at the time. This is uh, August uh, 11. But the compressor, even during the peak day, uh, the peak hours, constantly cycling on and off, on and off. If you look at the data, it's, it's probably 10 minutes on and then half an hour off. Oh, excuse me, this is minutes. So eight minutes on, off, on, and then followed by 35 minutes off. All the time. And during one day period, it cycles 15 times, which is not good. This is an indication of oversizing, because we expect during this peak period here, we want a constant compressor activity right there. So before we move on, let's uh, catch up with uh, some basic ter terminologies. Uh, I think all engineers uh, is uh, familiar with uh, the concept of runtime fraction, but let's start from the uh, cycle time, T cycle. T cycle is simply the, uh, the cycle of complete on and then off. That's it. And as you can see here, the indoor temperature, this is the set point temperature right here, T set point. But the air conditioning unit works based on the sensor, and the sensor will have a range. When the range hit the maximum, the, the air conditioning unit will switch, on, will, will switch on. And then it's on all the way until the space is cooled down to a minimum and then it switched off, okay? So the cycle, that's the cycle on and off. And then the runtime fraction is simply how long it's on divided by how long it's off. And then we have another important factor, parameters, which is the, the cycling rate. The cycling rate is simply T cycle, the, the inverse of the T cycle. So to give you the difference between the uh, runtime fraction and the cycling rate, there's one unit here that cycles 30 minutes on followed by 30 minutes off. We know that the cycling rate will be one, one uh, cycle per hour. Another unit has one hour on and then one hour off. The cycling rate is half cycle per hour. But both has the same uh, runtime fraction, which is 0.5. So this difference is important when we consider the performance degradation, how um, the performance of the RTU degrade because they run on a part load condition. If you can see here for one cycle, right, the Capacity when the unit switch on, it's not instantaneous that immediately it will reach the full capacity. No, it will slowly cross up the blue line here until it reaches the maximum capacity. So, as you can see, the reds. This is the performance degradation. And as you can see, the more you have the cycles on and off, the more you will have the rates. And the more you have the rates, that's where your performance degrades further. So what we, what we try to achieve by right sizing is to 
further this longer during the peak condition that it never switch off. So it will run exactly at the maximum capacity. So based on our measurement uh, result, we, we, we will plot this uh, chart with uh, the cycling rate and the runtime fraction. The dots here are the, uh, the, the measurement data. And based on that, we, I calculated the, uh, the curve. And the reason for this is we want to know what is the maximum cycling rate right here. And this is an important parameter because with this parameter, we will calculate uh, the penalties of oversizing. Okay? So uh, the target, the, one of the objectives of this project is to come up with signatures of oversizing. And based on uh, our measurement, we propose to have these two parameters as the signature of oversizing. That is, when you have a high Nmax, which is high cycling rate, and low runtime fraction, these two combined, then you can say that the RTU is oversized. Okay? Most buildings measured are oversized in various degrees. Okay? If you see here, this is building A, very high cycling rate, very low RTF, oversized. Uh, the worst is RTU 7, building E, which is very high cycling rate, up to a point where I suspect that it's faulty uh, unit and, uh, and a very low uh, RTF. Uh, we have examples where the cycling rate is zero, which means that it switched on once and never turned off throughout the day. And this is the right size unit. Uh, as you can see, the runtime fraction is one, which means it runs all the time. Uh, only two buildings, uh, I think, uh, that is right size. These two, F and G, are right sized. Now, how about penalty? From, from literature, the penalty is very conservative. If you, if, you, if you open up literature all the way back to 1991, what they calculated is probably around uh, 14, 15% decrease in efficiency and only 17% in energy. I would say only because as you know, when you, when you talk about energy savings in, in uh, lead, you're talking about 35% to get, uh, to get uh, uh, gold or even platinum. But uh, this is only 17%. Is that, is, is that true? Or is that, is that all the, 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 the penalties that is associated to, to uh, oversizing? If we provide the data, this data to the owner, and you say you want oversize, and a 17% penalty, and considering all the risks, they will say, let's go for oversize all the time. But I believe that the penalty estimate is very conservative. Now, if you look at this, uh, there is a small note here, right? Compared to the steady state value without cycling losses. Now, it, this, this is going to be a bit technical. You, you are familiar with this. This is the same with the blue and red graph that I, that I, I just sketched here. Uh, this is a cycling, the cycling uh, units, on and off, on and off, right? And then what, what it means, what this clause means is that the penalty is calculated by the same unit, the same oversized unit, 
that is run steady state. So the, t the penalty, the 17% penalty, will be Q2 divided by Q1. That's 17%. But for me, it's wrong. It's, at least it's not right. It, that, that's, that's not entirely correct. What is exactly correct is that we want the right sized unit. And, and to compare the penalty, you have to compare the oversized unit with the right size unit. So the sketch will go that this is the same oversized unit cycling on and off, but then we have to compare its performance with the right sized unit, which is probably only half of the capacity that runs over a period of time. Then the penalty we calculate between Q3 and Q1, and I bet you it's going to be more than 17%. Or even if it is the same, even if it is the same, let's say it's the same. Now, mind you, Idaho Power, in this case, don't have to provide half of the electricity. Because over here, let's say, it will require I don't know, 10 kilowatts, let's say. Over here with half of the capacity, Idaho Power will supply only half of the 10 kilowatts. And this is a big savings, half of the peak demand. So based on the equations, these equations, we calculated the part load factor and the part load ratio. Part load ratio is basically, PLR is basically what's the building load compared to the air conditioning capacity. So the, the higher the PLR, the better it is. It means that your air conditioning unit is sized properly as the maximum cap, uh, building load. The part load factor, PLF, is an indication how your air conditioning unit degrades. The efficiency of the air conditioning unit is EER or, or COP. So how, how worse your COP becomes when it operates on uh, part load condition. So we calculated this too, and as you can see, our measurement has about, about 12% the maximum range uh, between 12% to the minimum is about 6%. And this is, compared to the old literature, it's 14%, 15% efficiency degradation, which is confirming the old data. And another one is about part load ratio. It's the, the, uh, the degree of oversizing. Over here, the part load ratio is 21%. It simply means that the building, the, the air conditioning unit, runs only 20% of its total capacity, which is bad. It's, it's way oversized. So uh, if, we, if we look at the uh, PLR and PLF, PLF as the indicator of uh, oversizing, you can see the signature of oversizing, which is the cycling rate and RTF for bad buildings, high cycling rate, low RTF, will always result in bad PLR and bad uh, part load degradation. On the other hand, for right size buildings, we will have a good PLR, of course and then a good uh, EER degradation is only half of a percent. It, it doesn't degrade at all. It runs exactly at the, uh, at the uh, nominal capacity, uh, nominal efficiency. So what about the energy penalty? Same thing, we put on, put on the equation right here, and then we calculate it. Uh, 
14%, 25%. So in general, we have 16%, which is, well, more or less that. Same as the literature says, 17%. But on some spots, we, predi we, we measured more, 25% of uh, penalty. So, uh, but then what happened, what, what was not there in, in the previous literature is the peak demand penalty. When you right size the air conditioning unit, you're not only saving energy, but you are also reducing the maximum electrical draw that you will require from the utility company. And this is what, what uh, we calculated. And we came up with the results on average 0 0.8, 0 0.9 kilowatt per ton and uh, peak demand savings. That means if on average the RTU here is five ton capacity, it means around four and a half kilowatt savings per unit. That's a lot. So this is uh, one, of the, one of the important results that uh, we uh, came out with. So in summary, two parameters that we propose to be the, uh, to be the signature of oversizing, which is the cycling rate and the runtime fraction. And as you can see, there is no fancy measurement instruments. It's just thermocouples or hobo uh, temperature uh, uh, sensors and uh, current transformers. Clamp uh, the, uh, the wires on the compressor and the fan and you uh, uh, record the, the pattern, the cycling pattern, and you can come up with uh, whether the RTO is oversized or not. So it's, it's, it's really important for me to, to stop here and summarize to separate between the measurement uh, work that we have done and the simulation work that's coming. Okay? With measurement only, you can tell that the unit is oversized and by how much the unit is oversized. Now, uh, the energy penalty can be up to 50% based on our data. It's not, not, not that great. The, the variation of data is not that great. But we can say that it can be up to 50%. The typical range is between 15 to 25%, which, is, which confirms the old uh, data in the, from the literature. And the peak demand penalty, this is one of the important results, is 0.9, on average, 0.9 kilowatt per ton. This is uh, considerably... Uh, f first of all, this is considerably higher than what was found in, uh, in, in the old California study. They found around 0 0.5, 0 0.6 kilowatt per ton. What we found here is not representative because they measured literally hundreds of units and we measured only eight. So there's not enough variation in our data. But uh, what is important is the parameters. We need to measure this the kilowatt per ton penalty. As I said, five ton typical RTU unit, we are talking about 4.5 kilowatt penalty. Let's move on to the simulation. We... Aaron, you might pause for questions. Yes. <coughs> any questions? Is there any indication of, uh, of the uh, cost consequences of on excessive uh, cycling versus minimal cycling, because that, that certainly uh, you have an energy saving, but uh, the, I could just see these RTUs just zipping out if they're excessively cycling. cycling. The, the question is whether there is a maintenance issue uh, with the uh, oversizing, the cycling or the uh, uh, running constantly. Uh, we, d we didn't. Uh, we didn't look at that at all. But uh, the, uh, 
the literature, from the literature, the, uh, the best condition is actually to have the RTU runs all the time because the cycling on and off will, will increase the wear and tear of the, uh, of the unit. Uh, any other question before we move on to the next portion? Yes. Was there any uh, measurement of the interior, the temperature on the inside? So if the unit was right-sized, is there a representation that it wasn't undersized and unable to maintain temperature? That's right. Thank you. Uh, yes, there is a measurement in, uh, in uh, indoor temperature. So we measured the supply uh, temperature and also the, uh, the temperature at the sensor uh, location. So both are, uh, uh, are measured. And uh, I can confirm that the, uh, uh, all the units met, uh, can maintain the indoor temperature as the, uh, the programs of the set points. Oh, oh, uh, <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> no, uh, because the data point is so small. Uh, so uh, I tried to uh, uh, to uh, take out the outliers, but it's it's not that significant the the changes uh, uh, in in that. Uh, I I would I would like to have more data on that, but. Uh, I don't think it's uh, statistically significant. Uh, any other question? Yes. Did you come up with a recommended recommended RTF and a recommended cycle time? Uh, no. I do, and I don't think uh, there is, because as as I said, the uh, the the signature is two of them in, uh, combined. Uh, and the one affects the other. So, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the determining factors not only involve the unit, but also the building and the sensor. So uh, to, uh, to come up with a recommended values is actually, uh, I wouldn't say not possible, but I think beyond the scope of the project with the limited, limited data. If I were to have more data, yes, I think we can have a statistical recommended, recommended values. Yeah. So really what you'd be doing um, is more like comparing a six and a half ton unit to a seven and a half ton unit and seeing which one of those has those attributes of the lower RTF and lower cycles? Uh, not necessarily higher in tonnage, but any RTU that has, so, uh, because bigger RTUs can be right size depending on the building load, right? And it also depends on the on the uh, on the sensor uh, characteristics. So it's not only whether it's bigger or lower, but we we want to have more samples, so to say, to have what you suggested. Yeah. No other questions, so let's uh, let's uh, continue with uh, with the simulation. So uh, this is with with the half of the presentation. We we have all the deliverables uh, to our uh, project, but we moved on to uh, to uh, to uh, study further uh, doing simulations not because I'm doing simulation all the time, not because this is my, uh, my work, but the objective is to extrapolate the, uh, the penalty data. From the measurement, we only have one day of data, or three days, depending on the, uh, on, on, on the building that we measure. So we want to extra extrapolate that throughout the cooling season. And then, this is probably, uh, an interesting discussion with the mechanical engine, uh, engineers, whether we can use energy simulation tool to size the, the, build, the, the, the building and the equipment. So uh, I ran the simulation uh, in three stages, calibration, sizing, and, and then I use 
the, uh, the data to estimate the penalties in terms of energy, peak demand, and also the comfort penalty, okay? So uh, this is building A, uh, a small building, three rooms, a conference room, and one, one person office right here, and a file room, a file storage, with the total of 940 square foot, and this is the design assumptions, as in design calculation. So what I did is, oh, this is the uh, unit in there. So uh, we have this performance data of the, of the uh, air conditioning unit, and we also carried out a, a custom performance curve to be used for the simulation. So. Sure. Uh, oh. uh, is there a way we can dim the lights? Yeah. So, uh, and uh, I'll just uh, go through this because this will be another topic for our BSAC probably, uh, Building Simulation Users Group, how, how to develop this curve from the, uh, from the manufacturing data. So this is the result of uh, the calibration. So the idea is to have the unit as it is, and then to have all the design assumption and run it. Okay? As you see, when we run the unit S with design assumption, the air conditioning run very smooth. Switch on once and never switch off. All, all day, all day long. Okay? Now, mind you, this is, we're talking about lighting of two watts per square foot, which is way high. Okay? Way too high. So, this is not what we measure. So, we know it has to cycle. So, what, what I did was, to calibrate the load. So we changed the load according to what was there during the measurement. So we counted the people at the time during the measurement. So we, the design says 24, so we changed it to six person. And then the lighting, we put it as 0.7. That's what we estimated what's there. And then the equipment as designed, but only in office, in a small portion of the zone. And as you can see, immediately it has the cycling on and off. Okay? But still, it's not too good. If, you, if we compare the runtime fraction and the PLR, okay, the measurement says 15%, 0.15%. And calibrated, it's still 23%. And the PLR is also way too high, uh, too different. So I did another case where I simply took out all the heat gains. No heat gains. No internal gains. So only uh, climatic condition. And guess what? No internal gains, it's close, really. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is, even if on the calibrated level, when the internal gains we predict, we estimate, is the same as what was during the measurement, we still have something that just take out the heat from there. So there is a heat sink that is unaccounted for. And from a, a little bit of detective work, we found out that it's the floor heat loss. Okay? During, the, during the design, and this is typical how the mechanical engineers now doing the, the, uh, the design, the floor is no, no, no heat loss. No heat loss from the floor. Okay? So, if we assume the floor to be adiabatic, no, no heat transfer between the floor. Yes, the simulation 
can the, the, the sizing result from the simulation is right from the design peak load. So the design calculation says it's 3.2 ton. As you can see, the, the, the peak is right about there. Okay? The blue and the blue and the brown here is the effect of shading, external shading. If you take out the shading, this is what you get. And it's not significant because, because this is on the north side. So it's, it's insignificant anyway. So if it's on the south, it should be significant. Okay? But then what if you define a temperature of the ground? And this is 21 degrees centigrade, which is uh, conservative, not excessive. Okay? Immediately, we, the peak load decreased. And we are talking about you know, a quarter here, 20%, 25%. And this is significant. It's, it's, it's the safety factor right there. Right? So, uh, I try to find the, 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 the root of this assumption of forget about floor heat loss. And apparently in the ASHRAE fundamentals for commercial building, it says that it's not significant. So you can, you can check this in uh, ASHRAE uh, Handbook of Fundamentals. But let's forget about commercial building and move to chapter 29. This is residential, okay? There is a calculation of a house, calculation on, uh, on the peak heat load, uh, cooling load of the house, okay? Which for me is not that different from the space that we that we measure. It's just different schedule, different uh, use pattern, but the building itself is the same. The construction is probably the same. And if for commercial with a single floor, it should be the same. For multiple floors, yeah, probably floor heat loss will be insignificant. But for single floor, it should be the same. And guess what? This is the table for the house. This is the floor heat loss right there, and this is the peak cooling load. And we are talking about 11%. Right, the safety fact, right at the safety factor that is recommended by uh, ASHRAE. It means that if you don't take this into account, you already have your safety factor right there. And if you add another safety factor on top of that, it's oversizing already. Okay, this is what I found, simple things about uh, floor heat loss. So we know that uh, uh, floor heat loss matter. So we uh, develop a scenario, four scenarios. Uh, as you can see, the difference is on the, the, the ground. So scenario one is exactly as the design condition. So we try to replicate. If the engineer use sizing tool, whether it's Excel spreadsheet or another program, sizing tool, can I replicate that with simulation tool? Okay, scenario one. Now scenario two, three, four, simply has the floor heat loss and then changing the occupants of the conference room, okay? So it's not 20, but five, 10, and 20, okay? So the difference between scenario one and four is exactly the same except for the floor heat loss. Then we run it. So as design, as you can see, Scenario one, exactly the same. So it doesn't matter if you use simulation tool, Energy Plus, for example. I use Energy Plus for this, right? Or you use the CLTD spreadsheet, for example. 
you should come up with exactly the same thing right there. But then we can have another scenario right here. Okay? And this is the level that we estimated. This is the peak load during the measurement. It's, it's right there. So we still have, even with scenario four, we still have some leeway here. Okay? Some leeway. And then, of course, it's time for the fun stuff, running the simulation, right? So we have four scenarios. We have four capacities. And we have another three types of simulation. So I run type one simulation, the whole cooling, cooling season from 1st of May until end of September. And then with the time step of six, uh, 60, uh, one hour, 60 minutes. And then type two, uh, this is with schedule of uh, internal gains and this is constant internal gains at the maximum value. And type three is only one, one day during the measurement day with outdoor condition as measured. So I change the climate data, change the outdoor temperature with the measured temperature and run it to see how it behaves. And the time step for that is one minute. So the result is that uh, capacity two and three are not significantly different. Even with four, you're talking about 11% difference, percentage point difference, even here. This is the penalty in, uh, in the uh, peak demand, and this is the penalty in energy in kilowatt hours. Okay? But what, what's uh, significant is we can, we can present the data in a different format. If you, if you use your uh, sizing tool, you don't have the capability to to uh, interact with your client and present the results, for example, like this. In this uh, chart here, this is for scenario three and scenario four. For scenario three, you can see this is the indoor temperature, indoor temperature throughout the day for 24 hours. And as you can see, Scenario one will always be cold, right? Scenario four, right here, it's still below 76, okay? So scenario uh, two and three will have times where it's above 76. And even for this scenario, it's above 78. 78 is the comfortable level where you, you, you will definitely vote that it's too hot. Okay? Between 76 and 78, it depends. If you have air movement, you can bear with it. Okay? So uh, we can present this result to the, to the client. We have four capacities. Okay? This is the right sizing, this is the oversizing, exactly the discussion that uh, you tried to uh, uh, mention. Uh, and this is for scenario four. Okay, under scenario four, uh, the conference room has 20 people inside there. Okay? And as you can see, the capacity four will start to be hot only at 4 p.m. It means what? If we communicate to the client, for example, if you make your big meetings in the morning, you'll be fine. <laughs> well, will the client take it? Maybe. Maybe not, but maybe, right? Because we can present it, but this is another way to, to, to present it, right? This is the indoor temperature and this is the outdoor temperature, okay? On scenario four, on scenario four and capacity four, okay, you will be fine as long as the outdoor temperature is less than 93. So you want to have big meetings? Listen to your weatherman. 
<laughs> it's going to be hard. Okay, make it in the morning. That's a big meeting, 20 people in the room. Okay, will they take the risk for that? Maybe we can quantify that. Okay, this is, this is the uh, uh, savings in terms of kilowatt hours that you will have for every scenario. Okay, and this is the potential. Okay, if you consider all hours, capacity four have 14 hours throughout the whole cooling season where it exceeds 78 degrees in the room. And if you consider only office hours from nine to five, it's only two hours. Will you take the risk for 37% in savings? Maybe yes, maybe not. But this is another discussion, right? So, and another thing is that we can come up with another scenario, another capacity where it's just right there. We can, right? But it's just that it's beyond, beyond the scope of the project for me to have another iteration for this. But the, the, this is the, uh, to convey the message that if we move from the sizing tool traditional sizing tool to energy simulation tool, we have more ways to convey the, the design problems to the client. Whether the, the, the client will take the risk or not, it, it, it's another matter. But this is an, an, uh, an uh, eye-opening discussion. So to summarize the whole thing, I'll just need to add that the ground heat loss matters and simulation tool can provide uh, can be a powerful a powerful tool in sizing and can provide a good discussion with the client and with that I end this uh, presentation and please if you have questions question there must be some there we go Yuri, have you converted those percentage of savings to real dollars, both in energy savings as well as cost of downsizing the RTUs? I, I did not. I did not, yes. Uh, I did not. I simply did not. Uh, it, it would be interesting to say the payback. Yeah. yeah. Give us an estimate of what you think it would be, the, the amount of savings. Uh, in terms of dollars? No idea. <laughs> we can use quick math of... Uh, uh, Somebody can do this, I bet. 2,800 kilowatt hours. 3,000 kilowatt hours. Times um, six cents. Five, five or six cents. Five or six cents. Uh, Somebody help me. <laughs> it's hard to do this on video on the spot. <laughs> <Video>. <laughs> Sounds like a couple hundred bucks a year, right? Yeah. 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 180. 180. 180. Thank you. Per year. <laughs> and that's only, uh, that's only from the energy savings, okay? We have not counted the uh, savings that the utility will have from the savings in the peak demand, yeah. okay? And, uh, or the downsizing of equipment potentially. And that's right. That's the first cost downsizing, uh, first cost savings. And the cost. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Maintenance cost. Main maintenance cost, yeah. So uh, we, we uh, put our recommendation to uh, Idaho Power to uh, develop uh, uh, incentive programs for this. I, uh, uh, I personally don't know how, how it will look it will f certainly f uh, feasible for renovation projects where we have old settings and then we, have, we can propose for the new one, but we still don't know how, how, how it will look. So I'd be interested in the, in the little bit of time. Uh, we've got, some, you know, we've got so a diverse group in the room and I'd like to get a little bit of a f a feedback about what you think ne next steps might be. First of all, I want to back up, of course, and thank Idaho Power. Um, and thank the folks, uh, engineering firms and contractors who participated because they kind of had to open their books, if you will, to, to be, and be exposed to some, you know, 
touchy subjects and there's a lot of reasons why systems are oversized and we're seeing some technical reasons here and there are, there are sort of some anecdotal reasons of concerns of callbacks, uh, concerns of you know a, a really extreme condition you know that's the peak condition, the peak design condition doesn't necessarily match the real extreme condition of a 112 degree summer day uh, when those 26 people happen to be meeting and it's got to work. So, um, but I really I really appreciated the some of the ex additional evidence that that Ari was uh, was able to provide to broaden the dialogue a little bit. So. You know, we're, we had some questions about, well, what are, what are the energy savings and what are the cost savings and what are the maintenance savings? I think those are great next steps uh, that could be pursued. Um, but anyone willing to, especially, there's a couple engineers in the room, anyone willing to kind of give us some feedback about things that maybe you disagreed with or other questions that we maybe didn't think about? engineering perspective it, it has to you have to kind of have the owner on board because the engineer is the first one that gets the calls that says I'm too cold I'm too hot I'm too cold I'm too hot so I think key is having the owner of the building on board that this is and the simulation say hey two hours of the day you're going to be that you know you, you possibly are going to be too warm or two hours of the year right two hours of the year two hours yeah. of the <laughs> year cooling season. Right. yeah <laughs> right. If any of the firms have gotten to the point, you know, we were talking about how you have to have these discussions with your clients about risk and if they'll accept that. Has any of the firms gotten to that point where you said we want to right size this here and it could mean X comfort? Hours, yeah. X hours a year. I, see you not. I haven't yet, no, okay. no. Um, the the issue is 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 uh, owners you know they if it's cold outside or uh, 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 hot outside it has to to, to yeah. always yeah. I would agree with comments made thus far. I mean, the, the client discussion, I think, is a good next step, and how do you broach that subject with them and get them to acquiesce to getting out of their comfort zone, literally? Well, go ahead. Is there, is there now a discussion about convincing owners that a broader comfort zone, in other words, some discomfort is acceptable, and, and thus that would translate into uh, lower capacity units? It would translate also into operable window systems. So is there a discussion now? The discussion is certainly starting, put it might. Why is it so slow? But then, but then, yeah, but then whether it will translate into a real design. So I think nobody is yet to make the jump. You to think it's a good idea to have operable window systems? That's, that's oh, oh. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> the idea of, uh, we have to put that in, in the context of the whole passive cooling. And uh, operable window is one of, the, uh, one of the strategies that we can pursue uh, to, to, to get that passive cooling to, to reduce the mechanical cooling. Uh, it's, it's debatable, some, some of the reasons why they don't want operable windows is sometimes simply security. They don't want to have operable windows, so close it. It's as simple as that. Investigating passive systems with, uh, with, uh, with appropriate uh, sizing design? Uh, yes, uh, but not in this project. It's typically what we do. I think that's a good example of how we want to work with design teams on projects. and. What I'm excited about, I think we'll just try to wrap it up here. And you know, this was a really Aries project. Um, I had the pleasure of supporting his activity, and um, so I can be a little bit impartial in a way. Uh, the the piece that I'm excited about is that it opened up a pretty clear, repeatable pathway for retrofit projects. So if we're swapping out old equipment, let's get some data on it and make sure that when we put the new equipment in, we just don't put the same size in because it's 
chances are because of upgrades and systems and uh, you know, improvements in codes and maybe lighting retrofits that happen along with this that um, we can kind of fi more finely tune the, the, re the, the replacement unit size. Uh, and I think there's a foreseeable pathway for incentives to, to back that up um, because there's a good track record and really known data that we can compare against. Uh, the piece about the simulation that Ari presented is exciting because it starts to open up this conversation for new construction projects as well. Um, and so having the, the data set that I think could be, you know, we only were able to get one simulation done under the uh, constraints of time and budget and whatnot for the project, but at least we sort of showed the pathway that it's possible to start thinking about these things on the simulation side for new construction and with this idea of comfort penalties uh, that we could present owners with you know, robust data like you were talking about and then, you know, follow through with cost analysis to help inform those decisions. So that's what I'm really excited about uh, as the takeaway. Um, I think this is also part of a larger discussion about right sizing of systems that I, it's just another data point or another set of data points within that conversation because um, there's so many factors and they're complex and they're interactive about how systems are sized and what is quote right size because some safety is good, you know. Uh, some safety factor is good, but what is the safety factor? And the, and the concerns I think that, that maybe were put forward is sometimes the safety factors get added on top of safety factors, and uh, so the double counting. But I was really excited about those two major findings of a repeatable pathway for renovations and um, at least a, a, the starts of a pathway for new construction projects and, and the kind of energy comfort penalty or energy comfort equation that, that was start to show. So with that, thank you and uh, we'll go off air and if there's more questions. <laughs>